Hey guys, I am so excited to share this episode with you. It is really close to my heart. We talk about body positivity and confidence and overcoming some of the unhealthy cycles in our life. And with that conversation, we do briefly talk about eating disorders. I just wanted to give you guys a little content warning, a heads up in case that's something that you're sensitive to. We do keep it pretty general. We don't talk about like specific numbers or specific triggers that we had, but I do just wanna let you know. So yeah, let's get into it. Pop the popcorn, put on your comfiest pajamas, and grab a drink because it's time for a new episode of Sierra Unfiltered. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode four of Sierra Unfiltered. Hey, guys. I'm so excited because now we can talk openly about your pregnancy. Yeah, that can of worms has been opened. We can talk about the great, the not so great. Which is kind of perfect because today we are going to be talking um, mostly about body positivity and our journey, um, confidence, kind of the high and low points of our self-love journeys. And, you know, pregnancy is obviously a big part of your life right now. And Mm -hmm. that's been part of your body positive journey as well. So we'll get into that. Um, But first, what you drinking? I'm drinking good old water again. What do you have? I have a uh, mini bottle of Pinot Grigio that I emptied into this cup. Do you, you miss better, wine? You better drink two for me. I will. I feel like, this is like the most suburban mom thing to say, but cocktails are just more fun. Yeah. Like, even if it's a virgin cocktail. We should do a mocktails night for you. Where I, I would make you a bunch of fun love mocktails. Because it's just so much fun. Like, the garnishes, like, even the flavor of it. Like, you can't compare water to no. a cocktail. No. I mean, maybe that'll be my unpopular opinion sometimes. It's like, I hate water. <laughs> water sucks. You really do. I drink so much water in Skylar, like... Literally, that's yeah. Has that been one of the harder things of your pregnancy, forcing oh, yourself yeah. to drink water? For sure. <laughs> I've tried everything. I've tried like the little like squeezy bottles. I've, My God! Wow. But anyways, we're going to be talking about body positivity today, yes. which is so exciting. But first, we have a couple segments yes, to get into. Yes, we do. Um, let's do, should we do bump date first or unpopular opinions first? Ooh, let's do the bump date. Okay. So this week's bump date is actually something I learned from Sierra. Oh, so gosh. I'm going to let her take the lead on this one. But Sierra, to jog your memory, yes. I'm talking about babies and swimming. Oh gosh. Okay. So this blew my mind. So obviously, you know, Skylar's pregnant. That's a big part of my life. Eventually I want to be a mom. So I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks about like child brain development in the womb and pregnancy and more like the sciencey side of it. And one of the things that I learned, I think two weeks ago that I told Skylar is all babies are born with the knowledge of how to swim. Like, which is shocking. It is a human instinct in the way that, like, all babies are born knowing how to, like, breathe. Well, you know, like those kind of things. Like, they know how to how to do certain functions. And swimming is one of them. If you take a freshly newborn baby and put it in a pool, it will swim. But the thing is, we don't do that. And so then babies forget how to swim and then they have to be retaught. Do you know what that just made me think of? What? I know you and I have talked about this before. Hmm. Do you remember that mermaid mockumentary that came out? You were yes. like a big disbeliever and I was a big believer, but mm-hmm. we weren't really friends at the time. No. If I had heard that babies come out of the womb knowing how to swim when I was in my like mermaids are real phase, <laughs> oh boy, that would have just been like game over. Does anybody else remember that <laughs> documentary? Because we've talked about that before. It was like a big thing, mm-hmm. but it was a mockumentary. It's like the people who believed that Blair Witch Project was real. Yeah. And I but remember- But it wasn't, what is, wasn't it on like Discovery Channel yes. or something like super legit? And it wasn't advertised as a mockumentary. No. It was like, this is on a science channel. And like, here's our documentary about how mermaids are real. And then it was like, "Eh, is it true? And it was like, the government stole our footage and this and that. And I remember, you guys need to find this if you haven't seen this. Because I remember so clearly there was a girl on my soccer team who was like 100% in, like, believed it, like, in deep. And I was like, I remember at soccer her being like, you're just part of the government conspiracy. And I'm like, it's a mockumentary. (laughs) Oh my gosh, maybe we should watch it. Oh, for a podcast? What if, what if you like change your mind? What if you watch it and you're like, oh, mermaids, I, are, mermaids real. are real. No, but babies can swim. It's an instinct. I mean, I'm not advocating for throwing infants into a tub of water and testing it. <laughs> oh my it, gosh. But the audiobook I was listening to from a neurobiologist said that babies know how to swim when they're born. I'm all, uh, Sierra, I don't know if you're going to be allowed at the hospital. <laughs> I like walk out of the room to go pee. Sierra's like throwing it. the baby in the bathtub. <laughs> She's all, swim, it's your natural instinct. Now, I don't know when babies <laughs> lose that instinct of how to swim. 
I don't know. Like, I, I didn't, the, the podcast or the audiobook didn't go that deep into it, but that is very, it's and so fascinating. You, I feel like it blew your mind more than it blew my mind. It's just crazy. I don't know. Well, Babies I mean, are, it's like swimming around in there. Yeah, it's crazy that they are like moving around inside of me. They like have fingers and toes that are like functional. I don't know. It's just crazy. Yeah. Like I read something that like if I like poke my stomach, they move. Like, they have, like, reactions. Like, they have reflexes now. You should try eating different foods and see if it, like, kicks or, like, I guess you can't feel kicks yet. Also, the podcast might have a lot of cuts because uh, Skylar and I both know the gender of the baby, Mm -hmm. but she hasn't announced it yet. And we keep accidentally saying the pronoun for that baby instead of them or it And so just be aware that if there's more little cuts and stuff, it's just because we messed up. And it'll only be for a couple more weeks. We just want to confirm with the ultrasound and then, you know. (laughs) It's free for all. Um, But what's your unpopular opinion today? Ooh, okay. So I feel like I've been coming in hot with these unpopular opinions. But mine this week is that I do not support or... I'm not a fan of people using animals for profit. Mm. So this can mean a lot of things. This can mean like in circuses that aren't regulated. This can be like SeaWorld. This can be like I support – this is hard to say. So I support AZA regulated non-profit institutions that are based on like rehabilitation and research. I think it's a very important thing, especially since like I'm going to raise my child vegetarian, that they are able to actually see animals and gain that empathy. Mm -hmm. Like that uh, elephant isn't just like a picture in a book. An elephant is like a living creature that they recognize is like alive and has feelings and thoughts um but I think that anything where animals are treated inhumanely or used like to like entertain humans I just can't get behind so but you're fine you you support zoos and safari parks and everything else that are not for profit and that are about rehabilitation yes okay so like I would totally take my child to like The Birch Aquarium in La Jolla, San Diego Safari Park, because I think that those places are doing more good than harm. Mm -hmm. I think that they're teaching, teaching kids empathy. I think that they're obviously like helping animals and creatures that are like going extinct. Like there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into that. Whereas somewhere like SeaWorld, like not to call them out, (laughs) but I think it's like, it's purely entertainment based. They're a theme park, you know, just like Disneyland or Universal. And I I just can't get behind animals being the source of entertainment. Yeah, I think for me, it's the profit thing because I am with you on that. Yeah. Um, Where like, I totally will go to like the San Diego Safari Park because like, they are not for profit Mm -hmm. and like, Yes, in an ideal world, there wouldn't be animals outside of their natural habitat. Mm -hmm. But, like, the good that it does with, like, educating people and getting people excited and driving donations, like, that's really important. Totally. So, but I think that's, I don't think that's too hot of a take. I don't know. Let us know. Well, and there are a lot of blurred lines. Like, even Kyle used to work at Universal and they have, like, the animal actor show. Mm -hmm. And I remember a couple times I would, like, get upset and, like, not want to see it. Because even though those, I, I understand that those actors or those animals are actors that are like essentially equity actors like they <laughs> equity are, animals like they get breaks they're right. fed the proper food like I understand that they are treated very humanely mm-hmm. but at the end of the day like they're being taught to act like humans and like they're working and I just I can't get behind an animal being forced to work yeah so that's my hot take <laughs> what's yours mine is a lot lighter um but probably more controversial because I feel like a lot of people Ooh. agree with you on that I think naps suck. Retweet. I Okay, because everyone's always like, oh, like, I heart naps, 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 naps. Steven loves a good nap. Here's my problem Ugh. with naps. Number one, I can't go to sleep on a normal night. I've had insomnia pretty much my whole life. I take a natural supplement that helps with it now. I've tried every technique and every sleep medication in the book. So if I can hardly go to bed at night, I'm definitely not going to bed during the day. Mm-hmm. So I just lay there. And it's a waste of time. And and I'm not even relaxed because I'm trying to go to sleep. And then in the off chance that I do really go to sleep, if I'm like really, really tired, I wake up 10 times more tired than I was when I went to bed. Oh, yeah. They're just never great. Like the other day I was feeling really sick and I like knocked out for an hour and I woke up and was like 
everything is gross. <laughs> like, my breath is the worst that it's ever been. I'm so tired. I don't know what time it is. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like, everything's just bad. Well, and then half the time you can't go to bed that night because mm-hmm. your brain, like, already went to sleep. So here's my strategy if I, like, you know, I'm really, really tired. Like, when I got back from VidCon, I had had, like, three hours of sleep every night for the past three nights. So I got back. I was exhausted. I laid in bed, put on Glee, watched Glee, and went to bed at, like, 7 p.m. And then Mm -hmm. I slept for, like, 12 hours. Because I'd rather, like, relax and force myself to stay awake than actually take a nap. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't think there's a big problem in the world that Glee can't solve. I uh, retweet. Can you think of any big problems that Glee can solve? World hunger. Glee solved it. Oh my gosh, the comments are going to be insane. I mean, Glee solves everything. Terminal illness, Glee solved it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know if I can retweet that, but but yes, Glee is a source of light. Have in you this... rewatched Glee yet? So we, we started... talked about rewatching it this year together, but then I know. we didn't. I started rewatching it. I just feel like the first season is like kind of a lot. So I'm on season five now. And I feel there's like six that's seasons. Like, I feel like four is the peak. Like three, four. I think three. So here's the thing. So mm-hmm. one, two, and three are all with the like original cast all there. Yes. Four is when they split off and like Ooh. some people are in New York. Oh, that's where it goes downhill for me. Most, the beginning of four was actually okay. Mm-hmm. Like them introducing like Marley and Jake and like that was fine. Mm-hmm. And then following like Kurt and Rachel. And these are Glee spoilers. So, I mean, the show's been out for like 10 years. But here's where I think they jumped the shark and we're like, it's downhill from here. Yeah. When Rachel got Funny Girl, that was like a little bit too much. Then now we're getting to the point where Santana got cast as her understudy. That's way and then after much. that, she drops out of Funny Girl to do a TV show, and it's just like too, too much, too much. Yeah. They just did What Does the Fox Say with puppets, <laughs> and I love that for it, them. Yeah, it, I, I think that is where they started going oh. downhill. But I yeah. think like two was the best season. I would agree with that. Yeah, I feel like two, three. Yeah, I love original cast. Mm-hmm. I like wasn't that big of a fan of Marley, which I feel like is weird because she's like very soft and like yeah. whatever. But I like Rachel Berry. She's my queen. I like Tina Cohen Chang. She was the worst. No. Oh my gosh. Now that is an unpopular opinion. What? Tina? What's wrong with Tina? Oh my gosh. Do you remember when she was like so in love with Blaine and she was like rubbing like Vic's vapor rub on his chest? Oh yeah. She's so weird. Okay. All right. Fine. 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 Oh my I, god. There are so many great characters in Glee and Tina is objectively the worst. I like Blaine a lot. Blaine yes. is great. Also, Kurt's great. Also, <laughs> Mercedes is great. Also, okay. everyone's great. But not Tina. Not Tina! So this is not a Glee cast. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, we have a lot of hot takes on Glee. Truly. Um, let's get into the topic, which yes. is body positivity. Woo. Which is so near and dear to both of our hearts. And I'm honestly surprised that it's only the fourth episode that we're talking about it. I know. So do you want to start us off? Because obviously, I feel like you're kind of like... I mean, you would never say you're the queen of the body positive community, but I would say you're the queen of the body positive community. I'll say I'm community. like a, a duchess. I'm not quite a princess, not quite a queen, I'm I mean, like a duchess. I mean, girls supporting girls. I love anyone that talks about body positivity, but in my eyes, <laughs> you're the queen. I love you. So do you want to talk about a little bit about like how you found body positivity and yeah. your journey? Yeah, I, I think right now is definitely the most body positive I've ever been in my life. Like I'm just mm-hmm. in a really good spot. I'm surrounded by people who really encourage me. Yeah. Um, my online community is incredibly encouraging. Mm-hmm. I personally have found a great balance between like eating healthy, fueling my body, and exercising without really getting too wrapped up in it or without trying to lose weight. I think this past like six months since the beginning of the year is the first time in my life I've ever been working out that, and it's not about weight loss. Like, ever. Like, even when I was, like, 10. so sweet. When I was, like, 10 and I would go to the gym, I'd be like, I want to lose weight. And and this is the first time in my life that, like, all of my goals and seeing progress is about reps and about, like, stamina and about, like, increasing, like, the amount of weight that I can bench press. Like, it's a – I I have fitness goals and they're not about my weight, which is amazing. Um, So I'm in such such a good place right now. But obviously it hasn't always been like that. I found body positivity very publicly. I'd say probably within three or four months of starting my YouTube channel. And so I pretty much started at square one. And I publicly was documenting myself uh, unintentionally finding confidence and finding myself. And it's been really, really great to 
find this community that is so empowering and so encouraging and it has been such a positive influence on my life um what's it been like for you I mean I think that I really have been um kind of catapulted into the body positivity community just like from being around you and also I think that like being around the people that you're around Mm -hmm. like I I feel like nowadays it's kind of coming around to where more people are in the mainstream who are like body positive advocates like Mm -hmm. I think of like Jamila Jamil but I feel like there's so many creators who are just like so empowering so wonderful that I found through you and also I think just like on a daily basis working on your channel like we're constantly talking about it and like that's constantly something we're like striving for and like encouraging in other women so I think it's like naturally kind of pushed me into a more body positive headspace I'm sure we'll talk about it later but like I struggled with eating disorders for a really long time and body dysmorphia and so I think it's something that like I'm still improving on every day I think that no one is ever at the end of their body positive journey but I think that I'm a little further back than like you would be you Mm -hmm. know I think that I'm still on that incline and I think like a crossroad I come to a lot is I think I'm so body positive when it comes to other women like I literally like I do not know the last time I like commented on another woman's body or thought anything about anyone's body other than like you look so healthy or like you look so beautiful you know and I think it's just like being in that body positive place for other women and then also like getting there for yourself which is kind of two different things yeah like I feel like I became body positive for other women when I was like maybe 17 Mm -hmm. and I was like I need to stop you know judging other women you know because in high school I feel like yeah I mean most girls are kind of get that cattiness that I definitely had and I think when I was around 17 I was like I am never gonna judge other women or you know I I really want to encourage everyone but it took another two years for me to get to the point of being like So if I don't value other people based on their appearance, why am I valuing myself based on my appearance? Yeah. It is a crazy thing. But like you said, like the months leading up to my pregnancy was the first time that I ever had like a healthy workout routine. Because I really, like I think I either like didn't work out Mm -hmm. or I worked out to lose weight. Yeah. And like leading up to my pregnancy was the first time that I was like, I am going to get strong so that I can be a mother. Yeah. And then the first trimester happened and I was sick every day and like didn't work out once. And like now I'm getting back into it. But I think like you, I think we went through that at this around the same time of like, no, I am working out to get strong. I am working out to feel better, to like have better stamina, to be able to go on hikes and do all these things. Because I think, I mean, that's all that you're taught is like you work out to lose weight. Like, what's the fastest way to lose weight? Well, even, like, I recently got a trainer um, at the gym because I felt like when I went, I was always still focusing on the same pattern that I had had, which was cardio, 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 you know, like, low weight, high reps, because it's all about burning calories. It's all about burning fat. And so once I started working with a trainer, which I see her, like, once a week-ish, it's just that good reminder of her being like, no, 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 no. Like, we're trying to get you stronger. Yeah. We're not trying to make you smaller. I may gain weight or lose weight in the process, but that is not the goal. Totally. And and I think that's a huge change that you have to unlearn. I think that's so important. I think one of the lowest points for me um, in terms of like body negativity was um, when I was about 17, I think, right around the time after we became friends, I really wanted to lose weight for college. Like that was a big thing I wanted to do. And I thought at the time I was doing it in a healthy way. Like I wasn't, you know, I I was eating what I thought was enough calories. I was counting all of them. I was going to the gym twice a day. And looking back on it, I realized it was the quote unquote healthy way, but it wasn't healthy. Yeah. I, I, if I would miss a day at the gym, like I was doing two a days almost every day. If I would miss a day or even a workout, I would literally cry and think I was like worthless because I was like, I'm going to get back to the way I was. This is terrible. I put so much value in like the size that I had become um, that it controlled my entire life. Like I, Steven and I once went to Cheesecake Factory and I cried and left because I was like tempted to have a piece of bread. Like how sad is that? Like that I yeah. couldn't enjoy going to Cheesecake Factory with my boyfriend because I was tempted by a piece of bread. Like that is so, like I look back on that and I'm like, how is that in any way the healthy way? And yeah. I, I really think, I, I don't think I 
ever had a ton of food issues I think I really had like an exercise addiction yeah um where for me it was all about like every single day twice a day at the gym and so unlearning that has been really difficult for me but I think having a trainer has been great because she kind of reminds me like no 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 like you know you have to take this off day yeah like because I used to be either all in it or all out um and it's it's helped me to be like I work out like three to four days a week and it's important for me to take my rest days. Well, and I think it's important to note that like we're all on a journey. Yeah. Like even like you with exercising. Like I remember a couple of weeks ago it was like late at night and you're like, I have a lot to do. But like also I didn't go to the gym today and I should go. And I was like, but also like if you don't make it, that's fine. And then you texted me afterwards and we're like, hey, thanks for reminding me that like it's good yeah. and I'm good to like take a night off, you yeah. know? And I think you're in a – a much much better place and I feel like you're kind of at like the full circle of that yeah but even whether it's food issues whether it's workout issues I think that like we all have to be reminded sometimes of like it's a journey and we're all on one you know well and it's great to have friends that can keep you accountable without shaming you about it totally because even like you weren't like you're reverting back to the way you were like don't go to the gym you were just like hey just remember like it's okay if you don't go like you're fine and then later that night I was thinking about it I was like oh my gosh like that was kind of the like a little bit of that like hey that little nudge like you're good yeah you got it totally I mean I think for me I like I struggled with eating disorders and then also body dysmorphia so kind of like the opposite of you Mm -hmm. working out was like never really like an addiction for me I feel like I was always too like faint to do that you know I just like never really had energy um but it has been crazy because I feel like I have kind of conquered I mean you never really conquer your eating disorder but I feel like I'm in like a much better place with it I'm like in the most body positive place I've ever been yeah but I do still think that like I have remnants of body dysmorphia like you and I even talked like months before I was pregnant and like I like I still struggle with it but the problem is, is that I'm in such a body positive place that I feel like I I think I'm a lot bigger than I am and I'm totally okay with that yeah but so even sometimes I'll like buy clothes like I just even I mean now I'm pregnant so it's different but I just bought a pair of overalls from Aerie that were like a size large because I was like oh like that's what I am now and they're like two sizes too big for me yeah. I should have still ordered a small but in my brain I'm like oh like that's that's what I'm ordering and that's totally cool you know well even all the time like I'm bigger than you and all the time you'll like you'll say things like oh yeah like we're like the same size and I'm like no yeah (laughs) we're not and I think it is still that that remnant of that but it's interesting because like you said you're in that place where you're like I'm totally okay with whatever size I am yeah but there is still that little bit of body dysmorphia that's like but you aren't seeing yourself the way that you really are totally so it's a really crazy thing especially I mean talking about pregnancy I feel like sorry if that's like kind of what this podcast turns into from my end but that's <laughs> what I'm going through um, I think everyone wants to hear about it I want to hear about it well I just you never hear about pregnant women t- like talking about their changing bodies or like the struggles of it I do think we're in an age now with like Instagram like I know like Colleen Ballinger posts a lot of like oh my baby spit up all over me in Target yeah. but I feel like people don't talk about like hey like postpartum like they don't talk about the emotion yeah like there's a lot that's going on you mm-hmm. know and so even for me it's been a crazy thing of like going to the store and like I was a certain jean size before and now getting a jean size that's like three sizes up and being like okay is that gonna fit and it's like oh that's too big oh this is too small like even just the not knowing of like before I feel like when I was like a teenager I was so hyper fixated on like what like number size I was and so it's weird now that I'm in a place where that doesn't matter but it's still kind of frustrating to be like please just give me a pair of jeans that fit I don't care if they're a two or a 22 but you want something that fits (laughs) totally and also like constantly reminding yourself um I know like we had talked about this with like one of our other friends who was pregnant of Like, what is happening to my body would have kind of been, like, my nightmare as a 16-year-old. Like, Mm -hmm. my stomach growing, my boobs growing, like, everything, like, not being able to work out, feeling sick all the time. Like, it just – but now I, like, love it. Like, I I feel like every day I come into the office, I'm like, Sierra, does my bump look bigger? Like, I feel like I'm able to, like, take pride in that because that means, like, my baby's healthy and growing and, like, wonderful. But it is so crazy to think back and be like – okay like this is good like it is good that my stomach is showing in this you know well and I think what's also hard is like we grew up in the pinnacle of diet culture so we were taught that like 
all the things that are normal to happen to a woman's body, whether it's through pregnancy or mm-hmm. just through getting older and gaining weight and your body changing, we're taught that those things are the worst thing that could happen to you. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I mean, whether it comes from relatives or ads or, like, even magazine covers. Like, I remember yeah. going into the store with my mom and, like, looking at the magazine covers and they were all, like, you know, how to lose 10 pounds fast, mm-hmm. how to look good for your man, like, how to slam down. Like, it's always about being smaller. Well, and now, I I mean, we still see that in magazines and in advertisements, but also it's, like, all over Instagram yeah. and, like, Twitter. And, I mean, even the other day, I saw an advertisement. So, there are, like, fit tees. I feel like everyone knows. They're, yeah. like, weight loss detox tees. But I saw one that was advertised to me for pregnant women. A fit tee for pregnant women. Like, to lose weight and detox and, like, poop your brains out. For pregnant women. Completely like, unregulated. I'm not even using essential oils. I'm not eating nacho cheese. But you're going to drink a, like, laxative tea that's, like, not moderated by, like, I just. Well, you know what those teas and those companies and all of those diet companies do is they are trying to prey on the most vulnerable people. Mm-hmm. So that's why first they're like, okay, who's super vulnerable? Okay, how about, like, late teens, early 20s women? You know, they're all yeah. concerned about you know, not, like, gaining, they're all concerned about gaining weight, they're all concerned about, you know, finding a partner, the freshman 15, so they target those people. What's another vulnerable group? Oh, pregnant women, because they're gaining weight, they're struggling with that. Like, what's next, toddlers? Yeah. Like, I just, (laughs) like, are they gonna, like, start selling it like, a baby bottle? Like, I just, it's so ridiculous. But I'm so glad you now are able to look at that and say that's ridiculous. Oh my gosh, you too. I mean, you get offers all the time from companies that are just like the antithesis of what you stand for every I mean I made a whole video about it but every diet tea company has reached out to me continues to reach out to me like all the big ones you can Mm -hmm. think of they are in my email every day teamy sent me like six being like we're super body positive like da 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 da." I'm like no you're not you are not but and you know Victoria's Secret and all these brands that aren't inclusive and that are all about trying to make women feel bad so that they have to spend money on their products they try to use me as a body positive figure to you know speak to my audience and I'm like I would never do that and I think there's a really really big difference between companies that still have bad practices reaching out to you and companies that have come full circle with it like like mm Airy, Hollister, um, Target even all of those companies used to have more like restricted size lines they used to photoshop And all of them since then have come around, have put in the work to have more diverse models, to expand their size lines. I am over the moon to work with any company who maybe has, you know, has had some issues in the past but are actively working to change it. But I will not be your PR save. Like, put it, you know, if Victoria's Secret put in the work, changed their advertising, changed their sizing, changed everything. Mm -hmm. And then after a year of that came to me and we're like, hey, do you want to work together? I would be like, absolutely yes. Yeah, go off, sis. I mean... (laughs) Sorry for the rant. No, I think, like, I think this is what, like, the beauty of the podcast is that we can talk about these things. Like, it really is insane that these companies are reaching out to you... As a body positive influencer. And want you to sell your audience these, like, potentially harmful products. I just, I can't wrap my head around it. That are all about projecting the ideal that I'm currently trying to fight to take down. (laughs) I just... I'm so happy that both of us are in such a body positive space that like we are able to recognize that. Yeah. Uh, But so when do you, when did you first get into body positivity? I know you said it was in the beginning of your channel. It was after I made, so I made a video that was like a curvy lookbook. Um, and I called it that because I was scared that I was going to get hate for people that I was in a really bad space with my body of people that were going to say, you know, you're fat. Why are you wearing this? And I would, you know, now I'm like, I don't care. I'll take that all day. Yeah. But back then, I, I it was like my biggest fear. I had maybe like two or 3,000 followers. And I made this video and I titled it like that in hopes that, you know, I'd be like self-aware of that. Like, you know, I'm not trying to be a size two. And people really resonated with it. And so from there, I found a lot of body positive influencers and body positive YouTubers and kind of built this community around confidence. But I was still really working on that myself. And I remember maybe a couple months after I made that first video I had a relative um make a comment to me about um losing weight for my wedding Mm -hmm. they were like they showed me an old picture of me 
and they were like this should be some inspiration for your wedding which first of all that photo was facetuned because I used to facetune my photos and second of all I was in a really bad place with my relationship with food and my relationship with exercise so they showed me this photo not knowing how absolutely miserable I was at that time in my life and saying you know you should go back to this and that was really hard for me and I cried I cried and cried and cried I talked to my mom about it my mom was like my mom really changed the way honestly I think my mom was kind of a gateway to body positivity for me because after that relative said that and I was so upset um she goes you know Sierra if they are holding you to this ridiculous standard and they're valuing you off your weight think about how they treat themselves yeah and they are you know every pound that they gain or lose is something that changes the way they value themselves and she's like aren't you glad that that's not you and I remember thinking like yeah I'm really glad that that's not me and I'm glad that I am gonna be able to go through my life and have a piece of bread at Cheesecake Factory if I want to and like skip a day at the gym and you know have an ice cream and enjoy my life and not let food and exercise and appearance completely consume who I am and I think that was a big turning point when my mom said that because I was like oh my gosh I feel sorry for this person who made that Mm -hmm. comment about me I feel sorry for them that that's how they value themselves and I think that was kind of like the start of the body positive ball rolling down the hill yeah what about you when do you think it was like a shift first of all I feel like we reference that all the time I feel like that was like one of the most like empowering things she could have ever said I think about that all the time when I'm talking to my relatives me too I feel like you and your mom are both like icons (laughs) like I the other thing I think about all the time is when you say like it's not your body that's the issue it's the clothes that are the issue you know who I got that from who um from confidence makeover oh yeah Did someone say that to you or did you say that? I think that was a conversation I had with Emily, um, the first girl on Confidence Makeover. And I think I kind of offhand said it like, your body's not the issue, it's the clothes. And then she said it like straight to camera. She was like, and then Sierra said, your body's not the issue, it's the clothes. And I was like, light bulb. Yeah. (laughs) It's just so amazing. I just, I just, I just love body positivity. Me too. But when do you feel like you kind of came into it? Um, that's a good question. I think I'm. I think I'm still coming into it every day, yeah. honestly. I think, um, like, maybe when I started dating Kyle, yeah. I feel like, I mean, even little things, like, before I started dating Kyle, like, if I was, like, hanging out with a guy, I would, like, wear a bra to go to sleep. Like, a, like, yeah. structured, wired bra. Because Not because I, it was comfortable. No, because I felt, like, uncomfortable in my body and, like, I wanted to, like, look presentable. Like, I feel like half the time I'd, like, go to bed with makeup on. And, you know, I, I think I, like, wanted this idealistic version of myself portrayed because I wasn't comfortable with, like, mm-hmm. me without a bra on, me without makeup on, me without, you know. And so I think it wasn't until I started dating Kyle and realized that, like, First of all, he doesn't notice. (laughs) Like, first of all, guys just, like, just generally, like, don't care and also don't notice. Oh, yeah. No, I started dating Steven when I'm around the size that I am now. I lost a ton of weight. I gained it back. I went down a little bit. I came up a little bit. I went down a little bit. He has literally never noticed. Yeah. Never noticed. Nope. (laughs) And so I, I think that that helped me a lot. Also, I think, like... Just being in a relationship where the person's, like, really affirming me and, like, compliments me on things that aren't my appearance. Mm -hmm. And also, I, like, wasn't actively, like, dating guys and, like, felt so, uh, like, consistently, I don't know, like, fixated on, like, looking my best, presenting my best image. It was, like, this person is, like, choosing to love me every day no matter what I look like. Like, because I look like a mess sometimes, you know? And so... So I think that's kind of when it started for me. And then I think like also just being involved in your channel has like kind of pushed it a little bit. Yeah, I think honestly like you are the people you surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. And when you're around a bunch of people who are body positive and who are encouraging you like you're naturally going to change the way that you think about yourself. And that's why I think it's so important to like be around people who Mm -hmm. are like that. Um, But I do think something that's a little controversial is like who is body positivity for I mean I think it's for everyone I do too and I think you know their body positivity was started by plus size women specifically plus size women of color Mm -hmm. um and I always want to give like full credit and full like respect to the people who have the more marginalized body types and who did start it 
But I think it's also important to acknowledge that just because someone looks like the ideal of beauty doesn't mean they feel that way. Mm -hmm. You know, you could look at someone who's a size two, who has, you know, the perfect proportions and the perfect hair and the perfect skin, and they may see everything that's wrong with themselves. And that's Mm -hmm. why I think that, you know, it's for women of all sizes, all ages. It's for men, Mm -hmm. too. It's for children. Yeah. I think, like, some of my most self-conscious years were when I was a child, you know? Oh, that's a good question. When do you think was, like, the peak of your self-consciousness? I think, uh, like, maybe sixth grade. That I was going to say seventh grade. Wow. Twinsies. I think (laughs) by the time I got, I think seventh grade was, like, peak awkwardness already. I think sixth grade, I was still a bit of a tomboy, so I wasn't thinking too much about myself. I think it was when I got boobs. Yeah. And, like, mm-hmm. my body started changing. That'll get ya. And, like, all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm, like, in a, like, I look like a woman. Like, yeah. I, what, what is a woman supposed to be? Well, and that's a hard thing. I mean, both of us are curvy. And I think, like, I, I don't know about you, but in my friend group, like, I was the girl with the boobs. Oh, yeah. And so I think, like, I got a lot of unwarranted attention from boys. But also I didn't look like any of my girlfriends. Yeah. And so it was hard because, like, my girlfriends would wear, like, even, like, baby doll tops were really in when I was in middle school from, like, Abercrombie or Hollister. Oh, yeah, same. And, like, I couldn't wear them because they just, like, were the least flattering thing. And so I felt like I kind of had to dress different from my friends. I also, like, boys treated me differently than my friends. So it was kind of like a... I remember, like, this is so messed up looking back, but I remember one of my guy friends introducing me to one of his friends as Sierra with the big boobs. Like, literally introducing me as that. Like, that, and that... I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. No, but, it's so ridiculous. But I just, like, do you ever have, like, funny situations pop in your head? Like, I just imagined us at, like, a networking event. Like, if I introduced you to someone. This is like, my client, oh. Sierra, with the big boobs. <laughs> I mean, that'd be kind of iconic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, like, even I, when, but when I said client, back. no, that reminded me of, I was at VidCon two weeks ago with um, Carrie, yeah. and I was joking around pretending she was my client everywhere, so I'd be like, clear the way, my client's coming Aww. through. But, like, it is so true that, like, being around other people who are body positive, like, even just being at VidCon where, like, there is this very, like, one Hollywood body, and I very much stand out from that, yeah. and being with Carrie, who, like looks like me and talks like me and values herself not by her appearance was so affirming Totally, and like I felt so much more confident going into these events knowing that like Carrie was on my side and like Carrie wasn't gonna judge me if my stomach was sticking out and it's it's great to have those people also I feel like body positivity isn't a crazy concept like I feel like it's pretty easy to wrap your head around Mm. like your body's not the issue Let's just, like, not comment on other bod- people's bodies. Let's just, like... Let's value ourselves for other things and... But I, it's really hard to come around to. Oh, yeah. And also, it just, like, didn't exist. No. You no. know? Like, it just... I, I remember the first time I, like, heard about it, I was like, oh, I mean, yeah. Like, that makes sense and let's have that conversation. But, like, I've never heard anything like that before. Yeah, I mean, I think especially growing up, like, as a an actor, like, in theater, mm-hmm. um, it was a very much, like, if you are fat, you are the comedic character. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's it. And if you are thin, then you are the ingenue. And it yeah. was very much, like, you know, you are defined by what you look like. And then coming around to the idea that, like, oh, maybe I can be things that aren't related to the way that I look. Yeah. Like, you're right. It's not a crazy... <sighs> mind blow it's not a crazy concept but it's I mean it is crazy yeah I mean also just like growing up I mean all my female relatives would constantly and I mean a lot of them still do constantly like make remarks about their bodies and Mm -hmm. even if it's not people commenting on my size or my body it's it's the idea that every woman I knew growing up was constantly like oh like I need to lose a few pounds before this big vacation or ooh, maybe I can squeeze into those jeans from last summer you know it's like I don't know I feel like when you constantly grow up with that like that's what normal is yeah I remember like even up until two years ago like holding on to an old pair of jeans as my goal jeans that to me didn't seem like a bad thing to do because it's Mm -hmm. like no this is how I'm gonna look but it's like how terrible is that Like, if my body changes and I lost weight, I can, you know, if I don't want to spend a ton of money, I can go to the thrift store and get a new pair of jeans. Or I can go buy a new pair of jeans if I do want to spend money. 
why hold on to something because that's just telling yourself that you're not valuable until you have that until you fit into those I feel like this whole podcast is just going to be saying retweet to each other but like I truly I just I don't know I completely agree I agree are there any elements of body positivity that you don't agree with or that you agree with but you find particularly hard to like swallow Ooh, yes we kind of talked about this in the um the vlog that we did with Carrie Dayton but I I think that a lot of people who are like the heads of the body positivity movement and are really like pushing forward are kind of at the end of their body positive journey and make it seem like there is an achievable goal of like the goal is that you love your body every day and that like you take pride in it you aren't fixated on it but I don't know if that's ever possible at least for me I think that maybe for some people but I think a good majority of people are always gonna have like little things like even if it's like oh my pants are a little snug today or you know I just I think that it's important to also place equal value on like who you are as a person I think it's also important to if people want to like work towards being healthier like that's okay like I think a lot of body positivity is kind of like anti-workout anti like not eating salads but you know what I mean like eat whatever you want eat pizza for every meal and that's great don't restrict yourself but also like if you want to make healthier choices because like you're pregnant or like you just want to be in a healthier spot or if you have health concerns that are you know yeah like you're that losing weight could fix that's 100% okay yeah what do you think I mean I I agree with that I think it it's a tricky thing from person to person, which is why I think making a blanket statement one way or the other is mm-hmm. never going to be the right way. Yeah. I think my biggest thing that I struggle with is the idea that, like, body positivity is only for certain sizes. Yeah. Because um, the most insecure I've ever been in my life was when I was the smallest I've ever been. Yeah. Um, which I made, like, a long Instagram post about that a while ago. But it was basically, like, I had this idea that when I lost weight, and I think so many women have this idea – if I got to that goal weight and that goal size, I would be so happy. Mm-hmm. I had all these plans. I was going to, you know, go hiking and feel comfortable just wearing a sports bra. I was going to be able to wear tight-fitting dresses and feel good. I was going to go to the beach and take photos for my Instagram. Um, and I got to that size and I actually did none of those things and really regressed in the way I felt about myself because I had lost the weight. I had gotten to the size that I thought was supposed to make me happy, but I hadn't done the mental work. And I looked in the mirror and I hyper fixated on everything that I saw that was wrong. Instead of being like, wow, you know, this is the size I always wanted. It was now everything else is wrong with me. And it's, it's difficult because I think a lot of people would have looked at me in the way that I looked back then and been like, oh, she must be so confident, you know? I am so much more confident than I am now. Mm-hmm. And I think the girls who are in that position that I was need body positivity just as much as I do now. Agree. I couldn't agree more. I just wish more people knew that, you know, losing weight doesn't make you confident. I see so many comments on my videos when I'll talk about being insecure about my stomach. They're like, well, if you don't like it, just change it. And it's like, that doesn't solve the mental block. Yeah. You know, I could have the flattest stomach in the world. But if I didn't change the way I think about myself, I'm still going to look in the mirror and be unhappy. And so I think if you are someone who's on a weight loss journey and you want to lose weight for you, that's your prerogative. But you have to do the mental work too because otherwise you're going to get to that end goal and be just as miserable as you were when you started. Yeah. I feel like that's a great place to end it. I feel like that was like the perfect my monologue wrap up. <laughs> I just I agree so much with everything you say. Should we get into the voicemails? Yes. Me pick someone on commented. They're like, I thought the phones were gonna be real. So oh I'll my gosh, pretend. I'm listening to the voicemail. <laughs> it has been so fun. By the way, um, you guys can call eight seven seven eight Sierra if you live in the U S. to Leave a voicemail for us to give advice. Or if you are international, you can send us a voice memo to the email, which is sierraunfiltered at gmail dot com. Woo woo. Hey, Sierra. So recently I went through anorexia and since then I've gained a lot of weight and I feel extremely like overweight and self-conscious, but you've helped me love my curves. But I still like look back at pictures and want to compare myself to my skinny self, I guess. And also I'm having trouble because like other people, I don't want other people to think that I've gained weight or like think I'm not as pretty 
and it's an internal thing, I know, but I kind of have been, like, avoiding public situations, and it's super unhealthy, but I don't want people to, like, look at me and be like, wow, she's gained a lot of weight. She's, like, she looked way better when she was thinner. So I'm just, like, having trouble with that, and I was wondering if you could give me advice. Thank you. First of all, I love you so much. Um, You are so valuable, and I'm so proud of you for recovering. Yeah, that's so amazing. It's a a very hard thing to do that I don't have personal experience with. I know you do. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that first since you have more experience with it? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, first of all, I went through exactly what you're going through, so I completely understand. I mean, even, like, now, I've felt, I mean, I've gained a lot of weight. I've been pregnant for three months, and I haven't been able to tell anyone. Like, even on, like, some of the podcast promo pictures, people were commenting, being like, wasn't Skylar saying that she was a size two? Like, oh, like either she's pregnant or she's gained a ton of weight, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that you're always going to be recovering. I mean, at least from me and the people that I've talked to, um, there's, there's never truly like an end goal. And so I think like constantly reminding yourself that like you are perfect the way that you are and that Like, you can't slip back into that negative headspace and, like, surrounding yourself with people who, like, uplift you and encourage you to, like, who cares? Who cares? If I had just gained weight and I wasn't pregnant, that would have also been fine. Yeah. You know? And so I think that, like, it's so hard. It's so hard to give anyone advice on, like, recovering from eating disorders because I think, first of all, they're so personal. Like, Mm -hmm. everyone's journey is, like, so specific to them. It's such a hard thing, and I think, like, only time can help, you know? Mm-hmm. And also, like, there are so many wonderful people on the internet that you can follow. Yeah, I, I mean, even, like, my editor, Rachel, she has a channel called Ladle by Ladle that's mm-hmm. all about eating disorder to recovery. I would highly recommend her channel. She talks yeah. a lo- about a lot of really great stuff. Um, I think another thing is just it's easy to look at old photos where you were thinner and only remember the way that you think of it now. Yes. But you can – Rem- try to remember if you are in a situation where you're looking at those old photos or you're talking to people who used to know you when you were smaller remember the part that you can't see in that mm-hmm. the um the pain the sadness the complete encompassing of your mental space with just obsession of, of food and and dieting and um remember who you are now and how much happier and more vibrant you are and even if you're struggling to still come to terms with that kind of stuff like just remember how far you've come and that like yeah you can look back at those photos and be like oh I wish I was that size but you don't wish you were that person because you're so much better off now Mm -hmm. I was literally going through my Instagram the other day because I was seeing if like there's anything I want to like delete now that I'm becoming more of like a person in the public eye and I saw a picture of myself and I was like wow I like had like long dark hair and It was a totally different point in my life. And I was like, I look so good there. Like, wow, like maybe I should dye my hair dark. Maybe I should start wearing hair extensions again. Like this, that, and the other. And then I remembered that literally the day that that photo was taken, after it was taken, I had a panic attack in like a public restroom. And like I hadn't eaten in days. And it was like a huge, it was an awful day. Like it was one of the worst days. But you don't see that. But I literally forgot. I literally now where I'm at currently saw that picture and was like wow I look so happy I look glowing in that picture yeah and it's like no that was an awful time right. and I think it's so hard to first of all like remember the headspace that you were at I think our brain like our human brain just generally like wants to remember the good things yeah. you know and so I think it is so important to look back and remember like I'm so much happier now I'm so much healthier now and, like, your body is your temple, yeah. you know? Like, you got to fuel your body. Like, think of food as fuel, yeah. you know? Also, therapy. Yes. Um, Seriously, seriously recommend talking to someone who mm-hmm. is educated in the space of eating disorders. Um, Because, you, can, you know, talking to us, like, we can give our anecdotal advice on what's worked for us or what we've yeah. seen. You can talk to friends and family. But at the end of the day, the people who can help you really conquer it are going to be trained professionals. So... Take everything we say with a grain of salt. Highly recommend therapy. I've been in therapy. I have. It's it's really important, especially when you're going through something like that. And there's no shame in getting help. So therapy. <laughs> but I'm proud of you. And I love you. And you're doing awesome. Okay. Next one. Hi, Sierra. Hi, Hi Skylar. Hey. My name's Maggie. Um, big fam. Love you both. 
to death. Um, mm-hmm. Also, um, I guess what I want advice on is I love trying to go to the gym. I love getting in my little gym freak moments mm-hmm. and then I fall out of them and I stop trying and I stop going because I don't see improvement and that's okay. However, it's not. I want to stay. I want to keep going regardless of how my body changes or not. I want to keep going for the mental health and honestly the physical aspect as well. So I was just wondering what keeps you motivated at the gym, what keeps you going as often as you do because I would love to. Um, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Maggie. Oh, my gosh. She's so sweet. Well, I totally relate to the super hot and cold on exercise, like either going all the time every day or like not at all. Um, so first of all, like, it's totally normal to go, you know, in and out of like going all the time, feeling super motivated and then not, you know, especially when you get, when life things happen, you get really busy or, you know, work gets overwhelming or you're traveling. Like, you know, that's totally fine to take time off from going to the gym. I love what you said about, um, making it about you and your mental health, because that's one of the things that's helped me the most is, Um, going to the gym and looking for a mental break and not looking for you know weight loss or or shrinking my body or anything like that if you're looking I know you mentioned about um, results and not seeing the results that you want I think what's really helpful is having measurable results that aren't about your aesthetic so like for me um, like this month my goal was to get to be able to do it may sound stupid but I have no upper body strength um, eight assisted pull-ups on the assisted pull-up machine Um, before when I started I could do like maybe two and that wasn't something that is about weight or about um, like changing my body but it was something that kept me motivated to go you know three or four times a week because I was like I got to keep building up this muscle I really want to be able to do eight assisted pull-ups and now I can and it's great and so I think setting those goals you know maybe it's upping reps or um, whatever it is setting those goals that are really Uh, attainable and also aren't placing your value in something that's like your aesthetic also um I think it's really great to take those breaks so maybe instead of committing fully and going you know every single day for a month and then not at all the next month maybe go two or three times a week um and plan it into your schedule and make it something that's exciting for you like for me I love going to the gym because a I get all my frustration out and b I'm not on my phone And I like having that time. Like even yesterday we worked so late and I was supposed to go to the gym and I was like, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. It's too late. And then I went and I felt so freaking good after because I took that medicine ball and I smashed it on the ground and I was like doing all my stuff and I felt good. And so really focus on exercises that make you feel good and that you enjoy. If you don't enjoy doing a certain exercise, don't do it. If you don't like working your upper body, that's fine. Don't do it. You don't like cardio? Don't do it. You don't like circuits? Don't do it. Try a bunch of different things, figure out what you like, and stick to that. And that was my ramble, so what do you have to say? <laughs> I mean, I feel like you kind of said everything that I could have possibly said. I think my my biggest thing, like when I heard the question, was really finding exercises that you're passionate about. I have hated exercise my entire life. Like literally, it's like the running joke in my family because I'm in like a sports family that my first semester of freshman year, I got all A's in my classes and like honors classes and I got an F in PE. (laughs) An F. All you have to do is show up. In physical education. Because I like wouldn't. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to run the mile. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Like I just like have no interest in like getting sweaty. I have no interest. Like I just... I'm not athletically inclined. Like, I didn't crawl as a baby, so I have, like, no hand-eye coordination. Like, I just, whatever. Um, But so then I, like, transferred into dance, which I loved. Like, I was so passionate about dance. I was able to, like, choreograph for shows that I'm in. And now I have, like, found a new passion for, like, Pilates and yoga. And even, like, before I was pregnant, I loved doing, like, at Soul Cycle, they did Hamilton days yes. at the one in town in San Diego. And so, like, I wouldn't go to normal Soul Cycle, but if they were doing Hamilton, I am in. Because you like, enjoy it. Yeah, I, w- I can bet you will never in my life see me running on a treadmill again. And that's fine. I hate running. Yeah. That's not who I am. Yoga, I could do that every day. Yeah. Like, because I love, like, the headspace of it. I love meditating. Like, it 
So I think really finding things that you enjoy aside from them being an exercise Mm -hmm. is great. Also, I don't know if you like musical theater. That's kind of a big presumption to make. But Sierra and our editor Rachel turned me on to this guy who now I follow him on YouTube and I've been doing his routines. Oh, you did? Yes, I did the like waitress one and then I did the rent one. I love it. It's 365 Broadway. I think it's 567 Broadway. Oh, 567 Broadway. (laughs) That makes sense. 5678. I was thinking, you know. Um, but he does so he's in LA if you're in LA and he does um, Broadway themed fitness classes that are super body positive Mm -hmm. Um, and then he also records them and puts them on YouTube so we'll link him in the description but that's something where like the other night it was so funny I was like literally home alone I put like my full length mirror like I moved it across so it was like next to my TV and I was just like singing waitress like jazz squaring it up just like so into it and I had the most fun I've had in so long and I got like a great workout of it and like moved my body you know and so I think it's like really identifying like what your passions are and going through it that way retweet Ooh. Is re- is the phrase retweet trademarked? Like, could we make retweet merch? Because I feel like people... I would love that. <laughs> Let's get on that. We'll see. Retweet merch. Okay, next question. I, I love that uh, Carly... So Carly's been picking the questions, yeah. so we don't hear them before. And I love, Carly, you've, like, focused them in on the topic, which is so fun. I love it. Okay, third one. Hi, Sierra. Hi, Hi Skyler. My name's hey. Angelina. Hi, Angelina. Um, I am a plus size woman and I am in theater and I was just wondering how to deal with feeling like you're not enough when auditioning for a show. Um, I will be auditioning for Shrek the Musical and I really want to be Fiona, but I'm worried about being a size 22 and not getting the role. Thank you guys so much. First of all, Angelina, um, shout out to you for being a theater fan. Skylar Woo! has way too much knowledge about Shrek the Musical. Oh my gosh, I have done Shrek the Musical <laughs> so many times. I've lighting designed it. I've stage managed it. Big fan of Shrek the Musical. Kyle and I, <laughs> this is a little off topic. The other day we were driving in the car and I was listening to Next to Normal. And he was like, it makes me really happy that I feel like you used to relate all of your ex-boyfriends to like Heathers and Next to Normal and kind of like angsty musicals. And the only thing you relate me to is like Shrek from <laughs> Shrek the Musical. <laughs> but it's true. We say this is our story all the time. Oh, but anyways, cute. love Shrek the Musical. Yeah. Love that you're a theater person. I think I'll let Sierra speak on this one because I know like you, I mean, that's part of why you started your YouTube channel. Yeah. Because of this exact problem. Yeah, I think um, – as actors, it's really easy to fall into that hole of feeling like you can only play a certain type because of your size. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that, especially in current day, most directors don't think like that. Yeah. They aren't looking at your size. They aren't looking at ethnicity. They are looking for the one who embodies that character. So if you're auditioning for Fiona, really, instead of putting that time and that energy into thinking, oh, you know, do I look the right way? Do I, you know, have the right look? Put it into like really figuring out that character and really getting in deep and like, you know, what is she about and trying to figure that out because ultimately that's what you have control of. You have control of the way you do it, your audition and the way you do it, your callback and the way that you portray yourself. And you don't have control over if you are the right look for them or not because ultimately at the end of the day, that's the director's problem. Catherine Steele had a really great video about this the other day. If you don't follow Catherine Steele and you're a theater person, you should. Link in the description. Um, She's one of Sierra's friends. and I've, like, met her. She's very lovely. Uh, But she had a video all about, like, problematic dream casting. So, like, when people would ask her, and the same for me, and I'm sure the same for you, of, like, what are your dream roles? I feel like the list in my head is people that, like, I kind of want to be. If that makes sense. And also people that I could see others casting me as. You know? So it's... And it was never anything out of, like, my wheelhouse. And I think it's important to be able to say, like, no. You know what? Maybe I'm not the typical Fiona, but I relate to Fiona. And, like, I love her songs. And my dream role is Fiona. And I'm going to go in there. I'm going to crush it. And they're going to cast me. Yeah. You know? Because all the time, I mean, especially, like, in current day, I feel like that happens so much where, you know, someone gets cast and it's, like, gender swapped. Or, you know, it's And I think another thing to remember is, like, 
if you don't get the part, don't immediately go to it's because I'm plus size because I used to do that all the time. Mm-hmm. I used to be like, oh my gosh, I didn't get the part because I'm not thin enough. I'm not this enough. I'm not that enough. 99% of the time, that's not it. The directors just had a different vision or they liked you better for a different role or, you know, maybe there was someone else who did better. Um, yeah. And I think it's easy to go to our first place of insecurity, which oftentimes is our weight or our size or our appearance. But just remember that like that's not that's usually not what it's about. So if if you audition and you get it, that's amazing. And I'm so excited for you. And if you don't like it's not about the way you look. I think that's such an important point. There is like a trend going around in like the Broadway community right now where people will like sing songs for parts that they never get cast as and they like hold up a sign that's like too fat, too skinny, too whatever. And I love the idea behind that. But also I think like you shouldn't use any of those things as an excuse because I think that we are like we're in a progressive time. We like I don't know. I feel like the – there's still eons and eons to go um, with like inclusivity and especially like in the performing arts and in television and media and representation. Also, that's why I think more stories about diverse people need to be told mm-hmm. because, you know, up until recently when people stopped caring so much about appearance and casting, um, the only role, leading role for a plus size woman was Tracy and Hairspray. Yes. Um, and we need more shows about mm-hmm. plus size women, about women of color, about um, people of different gender identities because that creates work and that creates roles for people who are more diverse. And also I feel like for so long the stereotype has been like plus size women get cast as like the funny best friend yeah. or like the villain yeah. like Ursula or you know I think that it's so important to show that like people of every size, every gender, every ethnicity can be a protagonist but also I find a ton of power in those roles like if you ask me my dream roles most of them are like the iconic like plus size like loud character but that's also because that's like just my personality regardless totally. of size like when I was a much smaller size my dream roles were the same as they are now Paulette Madame Tenardier, mm-hmm. Ursula like I that's just me and that's not about my size yeah but it is also I mean that's one of the benefits to me you know my body changing I'm like okay now I'd maybe be a, a more traditional Madame Tenardier. <laughs> do, do you know what I realized in the last week? What? I think one of my top dream roles would be Ryan in High School Musical. <gasps> and I would be Sharpay. Like, I would love that. Because he's just like a hype woman. Hype yeah. man. Oh, you know what? Okay. Isn't that fun? Because you got to be like so eccentric, but also like a little insecure. We should do a whole podcast on this. But since <laughs> we like finished the questions and we have some more time, um, what are some of your dream roles? Like, and completely like not, not thinking about like gender or size or look, just like full-on dream roles Ooh, that's hard I because I, I would you love go first so like obviously in hairspray people would immediately assume like Tracy yeah I wouldn't want to play Tracy you know who I'd want to play Velma Von Tussle Ooh, you would be a great Velma like that would be oh me gosh. those poor runner-ups <gasps> might still hold some grudges like that's me that would be so much fun do you know who I would love to play who I would love to play Gavroche <gasps> in Les Mis. oh you'd be such a cute Gavroche <laughs> but like I would never be cast as a little boy but yeah. like I, like I love him he's like the underdog he's yeah. like young scrappy, scrappy and like, hungry you would be a really cute Gavroche thanks I'd want to be Madame Chenardier Oh, no, you should be Cosette, because then I can be, like, I that can was, sing the song to you. That was the first song I ever sang in a singing recital. There's Aww. a video of me, like, so teeny tiny singing it. That's so cute. Uh, but, yeah, we can get into that in another podcast. Also, another podcast I want to do, speaking of theater stuff, is Skylar and I all the time will, like, dream cast shows when we have, like, a long drive with, like, YouTubers or celebrities. Yes. So, I'll be like, okay, let's do, like, a dream cast of High School Musical with, like, all celebrities and YouTubers. And so, we'll be like, okay... Ryan, like, Todger Call, totally. Like, oh my gosh, that would be such a good so we podcast should do a episode. Whole, we should get Catherine Steele on and do that with her. Done. Also, Done. comment down below some people who you want to have be guests on the podcast. Yeah, because I think we, we're going to start having guests really, really soon. We just yeah. wanted to get a few episodes under our belt with us so that we get our, you know, figure out kind of the flow of everything. Yeah. But there are a lot of people that we want to have as guests. Let us know who you would like us to have. Yeah. And I think that's about it. Yeah, give us five stars on Apple. Give us a thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. Subscribe. Yes. Um, oh, write us a review. We love reading the reviews. <laughs> and um, you know what I would love to see too? Tag us in your Instagram stories if, if you're watching or yes. listening to the podcast. If you've got your popcorn popped, if you've got your jammies mm-hmm. on, if you're whatever you're drinking, tag us. I would love to see. Totally. Thank you guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.